welcome panel. So just in terms of the guide itself, um, we've heard about the guide and the changes that have been made and uh, how it's going to be very useful for food business operators and also local authorities. But here we are surrounded by people in this room that are very interested in this area and professionally want to understand and learn about what's in the guide. Outside in the wider world and the, and the sector generally, how are we going to ensure that this guide really gets the exposure and the use that it warrants? I think the enforcement officers uh, are key to that. And that is why we'd be so keen to involve them in the development of the guide. Because if the enforcement officers are using the guide, as you did when you and uh, as many EHOs have done in the past, then businesses will see that and they will start to pick up on that as well. I know that both UK Hospitality and the Food Standards here have very good comms teams, and I know they've got thorough programs in place to make sure that the guide is, is distributed amongst both the enforcement population and the business population as well. But I think the fact that it's a joint exercise is what is going to help to build it and make it live out there in the world. Sterling, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, all the people in this room are really committed to food safety and hygiene, as is the industry. But we know there are a lot of people that we can't connect to. So if you're talking to enterprises, they know a lot of this stuff and they use it. And I think the challenge for us as a generally as an industry is a small mum and pop operations, a small hotel, you know, a, a small restaurant. That's the people we've got to reach to. And I agree 100% with Daryl. Normally the only person they'd sometimes see is the EHO coming in. So they're a great salesman for a great product. Great. Very good. We've got some uh, questions from uh, out in the audience. Is it Ian, are you there? I didn't see you earlier on. Ian Cutler, are you down the back there, Ian? Um, is there a roving microphone? Get, great. Ian is from M&B, Mitchells and Butlers, and you've got a question regarding allergen information on printed menus. I do. Thank you very much. Um, during the, the, the June Food Standards Agency board meeting, one of the um, board members said, and I quote, it, when referring to written allergen information, often prevents any conversation as, if it has got the allergen in it, you're not going to have it. I quote this because it perfectly illustrates um, the risk that this initiative seems to ignore. With the constant and seemingly increasing challenges within the hospitality industry, um, and, and in particular the supply chains, um, as well as the increasing number of allergen incidents caused by other, other ingredients, does the panel hold the same view as many of my colleagues, that hard coding the 14 allergens onto a menu will actually decrease the need for vital and life-saving conversations and therefore actually increase the risks faced by um, hospitality guests rather than decreasing. He fancies picking that up, Katie. <laughs> I'm assuming you'd like to, me to give a, an FSA perspective on that one. Um, and was it Alan, is that right? Ian. Ian, sorry. Um, so well, if you've been watching our board meetings, Ian, you'll have seen a sort of lively debate going on over the last few meetings because one of the things our, our teams have been very concerned about is to make sure that whatever steps are taken on provision of information um, are workable, that the, the steps are taken with the impact on businesses in mind and that they don't have um, the opposite effect to the intended, that they actually are going to work in practice for the consumer. Now, we are actually going to talk about this again at our board next week. Um, because as a result of um, a large amount of stuff that is going on at the moment, I mentioned in my speech earlier the review of all the retained EU law, um, and there, that and several other things are happening this year which we had not intended to be working on when we first set our work programme. Um, one of the other significant ones, for example, is putting in place a new borders system for the UK, which we're, we're feeding into. So... Um, we've actually had to reprioritize our work and that is having an impact on the work that we're doing on food hypersensitivity because we are going to have to slow down or pause some of the areas of our work and one of the things that we are saying to our board this December is that we will keep working really hard on building the evidence base on, on information to consumers. So we've got research going on under, underway at the moment about the different business models in the sector to try and understand what might might not work. We've got um, 
a piece of research underway about near misses, for example. But we are not expecting in the next year or two to be bringing forward any further proposals for new legislation, for example, on written information. I just don't think that is, A, it's not feasible for us in terms of, of what's going on. B, it's a very complex area, and we are hearing these messages about how important it is to take the time to get it right. And C, I think there's no reasonable prospect of legislation um, in the next year or two, because, because actually we're all going to be focusing on what the existing law does and says and how we incorporate that into domestic law. So um, it's not something the Food Standards Agency has stopped caring about, but, but you are seeing us change our work programme, and that, um, that will hopefully give further time for building up that evidence base. But I'd be really interested to hear what the other panel members think about the evidence base and, and the situation you've described. Richard, you're an operator. What do you, what's your view on this? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually quite relieved to hear that because, and I, and I recognise uh, Ian's question there because what, what we must remember is that the, the regulate, what I call the regulated allergens, and, and you, you talk to 100 different allergen sufferers and you, you'll have 110 different allergens that come to light. When the regulation started their journey um, through all the, all the legislative processes through the European Union, there was actually 27 allergens that were identified, and it was narrowed down through various consultations and discussions with various member states. It was narrowed down to the 14, so there are other allergens out there. What I think Ian has done, whether by process or design, has actually made the case for the industry guide because there is room for having that conversation with, with, a, with a guest, with a diner, just to ask the question, you know, is there anything uh, that, that we need to be aware of? Is there anything, any controls we need to put into place? That could, now we have the industry guide, that can now be built into the HACCP. So I'm, I'm actually agreeing uh, that there, there isn't any need for legislation because the legislation is already there. Um, in, in its broadest sense, to be able to, to, to look after those people that, that don't happen to fall into the category of the 14. They may be part of the wider 27, there may be something else, but that's, that's actually the case for the industry guide. So th thank you for your question, Ian. What a great question, Ian, and it resonates a lot with me on, on two levels. The first level at the softy lunch uh, last year, I was sitting next to Owen's father, and when you sit next to somebody like that and hear it from the horse's mouth, what it meant to him and his family, it really shows you how important it is. But I think you make a really important point. Anything, anything that stops the conversation or inhibits the conversation between actually the customer and the business, I think is bad. So I think that should be the first thing you think of. Everything we do should be encouraging the conversation, not replacing it. And I come from Bath, where we've lost two uh, women in the last five years because of allergen issues, anaphylaxis, shocks, and death. And uh, Shane was the first person, was a teenager, who didn't ask the restaurant the question, does this contain milk? And because she didn't ask the question, the conversation didn't happen for lots of reasons, maybe her age, her confidence. Uh, but if that simple question had been asked, maybe she would have been with us today. So... I think, Ian, you make a very, very good point. It's about conversation primarily and the legislation to support that. If we're going to focus on getting the conversation to happen, then what is critically important is the training mm. there. So uh, one of the things we are continuing to work on is developing a level one training course because, because we've seen from, from research that you know, we're hearing that about half of businesses don't have any formal training, and particularly small businesses um, so we want to make that easier, but I think if, if, we are, if we are relying on the conversation, that is absolutely critical, and, and we collectively need to make sure that the right training is in place for staff. Hi, uh, good, uh, good morning. My name is Caroline Benjamin from Food Allergy Aware. You mentioned near-miss reporting, and myself and a colleague, Jacob Peak, we're working on a near-miss campaign. We find that with an allergen reporting, near misses aren't happening, they're, they're not being reported. Within the actual guidance, is there any near miss reporting best practices putting in there? I mean, we hear from environmental health officers they'd like to see it, but it's just not happening. I mean, what, what sort of view on that? Now, on, 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 on that, because we're moving to this digital platform and because things are moving forward, that is something we could easily look at go, going forward. But as of today, no, we haven't put near misreporting into the industry guide. 
uh, Chris Moore from uh, Compass Group, uh, just to counter that, I think most medium to large businesses do record near misses. We record everything that happens from an allergen perspective. Uh, a lot of them, unfortunately, are their own customers' fault. They don't ask, they don't read the material, uh, they take guesses. However, I think the challenge to your point is more about encouraging local authorities to record near misses. From members of the public who may have visited small businesses, there isn't a mechanism there. I think you know most chain restaurants, most large catering hospitality businesses have a mechanism for recording and reporting allergen near misses. I think it's the small businesses that's the challenge. I'm not sure, it's an interesting one. Uh, from, I see your lady there is um, pulling a bit of a face, so she doesn't agree. Um, for, for we, had a, we had a client forum last week um, when we were getting feedback from our clients on, and this came up. And uh, one of the bits of feedback from uh, one of our clients was we want a better way of recording near misses, because actually near misses are, are more common than you think, and they're not recording them maybe as easily or using our system as they could do. So we're looking at improving that and enabling a way of, a bit like you have with an accident near miss, you know, you record an accident near miss, and actually um, the, some of our clients were saying, well, actually, with allergens, we get near misses sort of quite regularly, in fact. They need to actually record them and learn from them and how they deal with them. So you were gonna, it's, I think you were going to add something there. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably disagree in some ways, because I think sometimes they're dismissed. I mean, from my personal experience, because I'm free from... Some of the large companies that I've dealt with as well have not been having processes in place. It's been a case, well, you know, um, I was at the allergy show um, last year with a colleague and we were doing a talk um, and people were putting their hands up and saying they were reporting it and, and the chefs were saying, well, you didn't die, did you? And that sort of flippantness is we need to get rid of it and we need to make sure that those, even the little near misses need to be, you know, recorded. Um, yeah, and I think it's happening with some of the larger organisations as much as the smaller ones. Although um, I had experience with some of the large companies and they have come back and fed back, it's the feedback you get as well for the customer. Excellent, thank you. Um, just going back to the guide uh, before we ask uh, another uh, question to the audience is for you, Daryl, in terms of the actual review process, um, were there any contentious elements in the discussions or at least those areas that drove the most debate in your in your deliberations? Um, there were several. Uh, there was a lot of debate. Uh, the one I'm going to mention is uh, low temperature cooking, uh, which we didn't put into the guide in the end after a lot of debate. Um, there was a request from one member of the food group, not from her company, but from her as an individual, to include low temperature cooking. And we haven't included it for three reasons. First, amongst the members, very few of them actually get involved with low temperature cooking. They're all mainstream companies. They are all cooking to a six log reduction territory. Um, low temperature cooking is tending to be more of a specialist thing for high-end restaurants and specialist burger bars. I spoke to the FSA about it and their view was, well, we want to review that anyway, so probably now is not a good time. But the third reason, and the one that tipped it for me, was this. If it is becoming an increasingly specialist activity, which it is, this shear and save and uh, warm water baths and so on, you need very high standards of hygiene and you need very high standards of temperature and time control. Is it right to put it into an industry guide that is targeted at the mainstream? Because inevitably, if you do, you are actually advocating and promoting the use of low temperature cooking to the mainstream businesses, and that did not feel right to me. And that is the fundamental reason why we didn't include low temperature cooking, particularly as going forward with an agile base, we would be able to address that problem differently. But it did not feel right to me to be promoting low temperature cooking to the mainstream businesses. And as the guide um, gets circulated and distributed, what mechanisms are in place to uh, enable uh, food businesses to feedback on the guide and for future future versions? Okay, we don't have a formalized process in place yet, but it is the UK Hospitality's Guide. It is industry's guide, it is UK Hospitality's Guide. It is down to UK Hospitality to decide how and when it wants to review it. If it wants to maintain the recognition from the Food Standard Agency and Food Standards Scotland, then it will do that in an informed and collaborative way but it's down to UK hospitality to, to, to decide how to manage that. So the process is likely to be around the UKH website. 
it's likely to involve some portal that'll probably end up coming to me in order that, that uh, people, either enforcement officers or businesses, can feed back. But let's be clear, it is UK Hospitality's guide. Thank you. Um, over to Claire Hussey, who's from Fridays, who has a question about the potential role of third-party inspections, Claire. So, um, you mentioned, Katie, about the pilot with the supermarkets at the moment. <laughs> at what point could a third-party inspection or audit be used as an alternative to local authority inspection, and how could we achieve this consistently in hospitality? That's a, that is an interesting question, it's, and it's, it's not a point that we are currently at. Um, so so third-party assurance has a, a role actually across the different assurance regimes that the FSA operates. For example, in, in feed safety, we already use third-party assurance to help us determine the frequency of inspections. We are, we're not proposing at the moment to be doing that in, in food hygiene. Um, what we're looking at with the, with the five supermarkets is whether we and the primary authorities for those supermarkets can operate an enterprise level process where we look not at what's happening on the ground in their stores, but at the quality of their systems and processes that they have in place and use effectively that sort of system and process regulation to say we're satisfied that you have got good enough um, food hygiene procedures in place across your entire enterprise. Now, we're proposing to do that um, effectively in a safe space alongside existing local authority inspection for, for the next year to just learn from it and see how it operates and, and, and enable us to take a view on whether it could in the future replace some or all of the local authority inspection. And as looking at those, looking at the supermarket's own systems and processes, it may be that they have third parties involved in those, but we're not proposing as the FSA at this stage to be sort of um, contracting a third party supplier to, to do it. Um, I think there is a more general question about the future role of third-party assurance in the entire system. As I say, it happens, or it happens already in feed safety. Um, there is now a process underway to talk about the border control regime for imports and you know, whether there are schemes like trusted trader schemes that might have, have weight in that. We'll, we'll wait to see what the government decides. Um, but, but we're not at this stage think at the point of saying we're going to make use of third party assurance in, in food hygiene. We are doing a review of the way that the food hygiene model operates. Um, we're at a relatively early stage in that. We've, we've set out some high level principles about trying to make the regime more targeted and proportionate um, to take, take more account of, of compliance and risk, uh, which would lead to some businesses seeing less frequent interventions from local authorities. Uh, and as part of that review, I'm, I think there is discussion going on about third-party assurance and people are obviously raising that as a question. We haven't taken any decisions in that. That's a review, I think, that will will take us over the next year or two. Um, we're about to... We, we're consulting now on implementing a new food standards model. The food hygiene one will sort of follow in a, in a couple of years' time. So that's the place we can have the debate about whether third-party assurance comes more into the system. As I say, we've, we haven't taken any positions on it yet, so I'd be interested to know, you know what views are around the room on it. Sterling. Yeah, that's a, another really good question. Um, I'd say I learn from other parts of the food sector. So third-party voluntary audits are very common in food manufacturing in a place that I worked. We had about six. And in fact, um, what the local authorities' approach was when they're doing their inspection plan, they could see all the... Um, standards we'd have got to and now customers come and visit us every week coming to check what we were doing and actually they wrote to us and said you won't be seeing us this year because we've got other you know, fish to fry but we will come and contact with you if we need to so i think third party voluntary inspections are good for local authorities because they direct their resources and just as a general people principle i i personally this is a personal view i don't see them replacing local authority inspections i see them being supportive of local authorities if they have the data of who's going into premises and what they're finding um, for instance if they were 
uh, they, they've been inspected by food alert or not inspected by food alert might be a decision that a local authority might, m might make on who would be the most appropriate person on my risk assessment to visit. So I would see it as supportive, not a replacement as a general principle. And I think, I think seeing what's happened in manufacturing, it wouldn't be unlikely that hospitality goes down a similar model. Members have two areas of concern here. One is it's very important that we maintain a level playing field and a competitive marketplace for food safety audits and food hygiene consultancy. I think the sector has enjoyed that over the years and that's good. That drives down costs and that drives innovation. So it's very important that there isn't a sort of a byproduct that the marketplace becomes distorted. So it's very important that we maintain that. The other area of concern that I have and it's a common concern. I've often been described as a critical friend of the FSA. Well, here's my criticism. The FSA continues to do a read across from manufacturing into retail into food service. You can't do that. But it does continue to do that. And it does concern me that they'll do this, this work with retailers and then do a read across and apply it into food service. And I think that's part of Claire's concern that actually, why are we not being involved at this stage? Because otherwise, you'll just come along and implement something that hasn't been designed for our sector. So that, that is a, a common gripe that I have. Will you please stop doing this read across from food service retail industry? Claire, what is your concern? <laughs> Nail on the head, to be honest. And it is that involvement piece um, and going to the, the wider aspect of hospitality um, and not just a select few. Does anybody else have a view on this or a question on this? Well, let's move on to, to Duncan Goodwin, who's from Loungers, who has a question on the requirements for the labelling of donated food. Duncan, over to you. Given the requirement to have fully labelled products that are donated, this precludes unlabeled or unwrapped foods going out through uh, food banks and such at, at their end of life or, or during um, a disposal. Is there any way to look at whether the labelling can be made more flexible, particularly around allergens for those unwrapped products? So if a food bank knows its uh, families that are receiving, they can accept products that are fully labelled, knowing that they're okay. But also if they have an allergy, they can say, I don't want any unlabeled pro or unwrapped unlabeled products, which would allow, obviously, uh, retailers and food businesses to dispose of more food sort of, uh, environmentally. Over to you, Katie. Um, so this is, uh, first of all, I will preface this by saying I'm not an expert on the labelling requirements, so, so don't take what I say as guidance, read the guide, and, and actually read RAP's really excellent guidance on uh, food re redistribution and labelling, which we would encourage everyone to have a look at. We, we've worked with them on the, our whole set of guidance, including that. Um, I think the first thing to say is it, actually food food redistribution, food banks, community food provisions playing an increasingly big role in getting food to people at the moment. Um, we, we track people's experiences of food every month in our consumer tracker and we are now consistently coming out with around one in five people saying they've used the food bank in the last month. Now that's, so there, there are a huge portion of the population who are relying at least in part on food redistribution. So it is really important, I think, that it caters to everybody, in, and that includes people relying on it with food hypersensitivity. In fact, uh, um, some of our sort of qualitative evidence suggests that it's, that it's even harder for people with food hypersensitivity with food prices going up, because obviously the, the more specialist um, products that, that you need are harder to get hold of and more expensive. So, so I preface it by saying this, that's it's really important that people know what they're getting through community food provision. We, we have picked up, we did a project with, um, with food banks and donors um, earlier this year and picked up a particular issue around um, non-prepackaged food and the labelling requirements of that. And I think if, if food is donated to a food bank and then distributed and packed, it, it can become subject to PBDS requirements it's a complex area. So at the moment, we're saying to people, please try and follow our guidance and the RAP guidance, which I think is the sort of mm. Bible. But we are doing some work with DEFRA to see if we can um, 
make requirements clearer for, for the businesses who want to donate in that area. Sterling? Uh, maybe to declare an interest, I work uh, for Olio. You've probably heard of the big food waste sharing app, making sure more, more of the food goes into our bellies and into the bins, and we very much welcome the great work you've done in introducing it into the standard. And it is a very, very good point. Uh, and we've worked very closely with the FSA and with our primary authority <laughs> to come up with a scheme that works. Our solution was uh, to get the food you've got to go online, and online you'll see the labelling of every product that you're getting. So there are great new online techniques that we can use <laughs> to give that assurance, but it is, a, it is a real challenge for people. You're quite right to raise it. Richard, a bit of view on this. Yeah, <coughs> I, I'm going to declare an interest as well because I'm, I'm, I'm here today from Accor Hotels, but I'm, I also have another identity. I'm the chairman of the Homeless Support Project um, in Lee in Greater Manchester. That's just a bit of a shout out. If anybody wants to make a donation, I'm here at the end of the day. Um, it's a tiny, tiny charity uh, that doesn't have any, any sort of uh, resource like I provide to, to, to my employer, um, but they've got me. And, and then I can produce some documents and procedures and what have you to, to be able to deal with taking in donated food. And, and they're, despite being a tiny charity, they, they do have a good network of regular food providers. And the, the question that's raised actually comes up time and time again. And I'm drawn into the charity because they, they know who I am and what I do. Um, to be able to provide them with answers. So again, I'm just going to make the point as well that it, it's making the point for the industry guide. Uh, for tiny charities like that that don't have a Richard Short, uh, that all, all they need is some guidance uh, to be able to do it right and do it safely. Uh, and that's where the industry guide uh, comes in. So that's my shout out for my charity, uh, but also a shout out for the industry guide as well. Well, before we come to your question, Duncan, uh, uh, um, Richard, Duncan, was there anything else you wanted to add to the, the panel's comments? So I, I'm also involved in a food bank community, ca uh, community cafe as well. And we get chicken, raw chicken that's donated at the end of its life. But we can't do anything with it because we don't get it until 10 o'clock at night. And we could distribute it the next day for the community to use. Um, but it's got a use-by date on it, and all the guidances and fair shares rules are you can't distribute anything past use-by. So again, how, how do we deal with that? Is there a way that we can actually allow a food bank, a, a registered charity, to have a process that's kind of under a, a fair share umbrella to distribute that food one day after use-by, which you know, for all intents and purposes is actually okay because of the, the safeguards built in? Um, again, an, another story that we definitely heard through that project that we've done. Um, so uh, what, what we've actually done a couple of weeks ago, we, we um, put together a specific guide for food redistribution charities. Um, we worked with um, Fair Share and EFAN, the Independent Food Aid Network, to test it out with some charities. And we've, and we've published that, which brings together, we hope, all the relevant guidance in one place and tries to make it easier for small charities to, to follow. We are, we are pretty strict on use-by. We are very clear that food that is past its use-by date shouldn't be redistributed, unlike food that's past its best before date. I take the point you're making about you know, kind of cooking the chicken and, and, and giving it out, but, but I, I don't see us moving on redistribution of food past its use-by date because there is a real food safety concern for us. Yeah, I would... Uh endorse what you're saying, Kate. For the charity, uh, the business I work for that's redistributing food, we have a HACCP system, we have a food safety management system. Absolutely, this one of our CCPs is you do not use food past its use by date. Uh, we, won't, we won't share food that's past its use by date, and we tell people if they take it in and it comes up to the use by date, they can't share it, they can't eat it. It's an absolute standard for us. Okay, Richard, it's time to ask the question that um, I'm sure will resonate with lots of people in the room. Over to you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's, uh, it, it, it's, this, this question is a bee in my bonnet, uh, which, and, and anybody that knows me will know this. I, I just want to start. Um, I, are there EHOs in the room? Yeah. 
put your hand up, Sterling. You're still in the age-o. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, this, the, it's the age-old question of inconsistency. You know, I, I, I've been in the age-o for 30 years, and for 30 years we've been talking about inconsistency. And again, I'm going to shout out the industry guide. You know, that, that's, that's where it is from. But what, what we have now um, is, and, and it's a good thing. I'm not, I'm not saying this in any negative way at all. A good thing is the food hygiene rating system, you know, because when, when that came in for the, for the first time, there was a visible, uh, transparent, public-facing, something to, to market, something to, to be able to get to the consumer to say, this food outlet, this restaurant, this cafe, whatever it is, has got this score. Um, or if you're in, in Scotland, is, is passed or has failed, or it gives you that primary information. My, the B in my bonnet is, is the inconsistency of applying the, the food hygiene rating system. Because uh, Accor Hotels, and I'm sure I can say the same for like Mitchells, and Mitchells and Butler, who's in the room, uh, we work across the UK, uh, and we meet different local authorities that occasionally have different approaches to the, to the food hygiene uh, rating. Um, and then it's an impossible task to be able to, uh, to, to appeal. It's an impossible task to be able to change a rating if you really feel strongly that it's been changed. And I have to say, it's an impossible task when an officer plainly gets it wrong. And they are fundamentally wrong with what they have, uh, um, um, uh, with how they have formulated their food hygiene rating, and the fundamental problem is, and this is the question for the Food Standards Agency, I'll get there eventually, is when you appeal a food hygiene rating system, you appeal to the same local authority that gave you the rating in the first place. So the question to the Food Standards Agency is. Is there any way that you can you can deal with that? You can combat that. My call is to have an independent adjudicator, like we have for parking tickets. Why can't we have that for something that affects the 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 the, the business and livelihoods? I'm going to put on my hat as chairman of the Food Hygiene Rating Scheme Steering Committee. So I do have more than one hat. So um, <laughs> clearly, when you do a lot of audits, and obviously I did a lot of audits head of safety for Mitchells and Butlers, many thousands a year, not as many as the local authorities. But consistency is always the holy grail. And you can put a lot of measures in place. You can put in training, you can put in test audits, you can put in test exercises, and the FSA is carrying out a test exercise as we speak for local authorities on food hygiene ratings. And there's about six, seven sort of levers and measures that you can put in place to help ensure consistency. What you don't want is robots. You actually want educated, trained people to use their judgment, and that's what you want to happen. And whenever you do get that, you'll go, you will get the odd problem with consistency, and it becomes the, whole, the holy grail. <coughs> and from what I've seen, the FSA do all those six or seven things that you would expect them to be doing to be ensuring consistency. The point you're raising is that, that sort of odd one that really goes wrong, and the actual appeal mechanism. Since there's been a change and businesses are able to pay for a rescore, that sort of went off the agenda, really, and the majority of companies haven't bothered for the reasons that Richard's highlighting, that you're actually just appealing to the same person who's given you the rating in the first place. What also came up was a recommendation that local authorities use their neighboring authority rather than going back to the same people. And I think it's a great shame that that has not been picked up as much as it should be. So you'll be very pleased to hear, Richard, that I've actually put on the agenda for the March meeting of the Food Hygiene Rating Scheme your question and your topic to be discussed uh, at our next meeting. And we, knew, and we have new representation from uh, businesses as well. But I'd also like to raise another concern, and that is ongoing, is the trials for remote visits. So we think we've got a problem now. It might even get worse if we're going for remote visits, and also in parallel, there's the desire for mandatory display. Now, you would want to get your act together before mandatory dis display, and my concern more is we have a parallel situation here where we've got remote visits being considered, and some of the work that Carol Archibald was talking about last week down in Essex, and we've got this desire for, man for mandatory. So we've got all these moving parts going on at the moment. That, to me, is a bigger risk than actually the odd one 
that actually doesn't uh, meet in terms of an appeal process. So I have picked up what you've asked, and we will be putting it onto our next agenda item. Great. Thank you. Katie? Well, first of all, I think Daryl's answered that really comprehensively. I heard the passion with which Richard was, was raising the issue, and, um, and it, is, it is always the problem. It. And, and as Daryl says, we do we do a whole load of things to try and ensure consistency. We have we have comprehensive kind of guidance in England where it's not mandatory. We have guidance that all local authorities are signed up to and expected to comply with. We do these consistency exercises where we get local authorities together and we give them a, <laughs> um, a simulated uh, example, and they have to score and then discuss it, and then we tell them what the correct score is. Um, all, all those kind of things to try and ensure consistency, but you're never going to kind of weed out one or two people getting it wrong because people are, are fallible and human. Um, but, but it is a message we hear very strongly and I look forward to the, to the March discussion. Um, that other, the other point that, that Daryl's raised I think is really important here about, about the food hygiene rating scheme and thinking about future reform. I mean. We love FHRS. It is our sort of flagship scheme that consumers recognise that we hold up as an example of, of huge kind of consumer information benefit. Um, and it's also, it keeps giving more benefits. So, for example, um, we, are, we are in the middle of, of um, drawing up a charter with some of the online food aggregators, so Deliveroo, Uber Eats, Just Eat. Um, um, who are all committing to using those scores and enabling um, customers to filter by them, for example, is one of the things we're discussion, discussing. They all require a minimum level of score to get on the platform, which I know is then a real issue for food businesses if they get a rating that's below that minimum level. So there's a whole, you know, it, it continues to be a really important driver in, in, in getting people to comply with the rules and in informing consumers. But if we are also at the same time trying to move to a kind of more proportionate uh, futuristic form of regulation that might rely less on local authorities going and inspecting compliant businesses frequently, that does create an issue for the food hygiene rating score. If, if we were to find a way to do regulation at an enterprise level of, of businesses, either in the retail sector or elsewhere, how do you calculate uh, a food hygiene rating score for an individual premises that, that people have come to rely on? And if we were to get to a place where compliant businesses are getting much more, much less frequent inspection, then that score gets older and less valuable to the consumer. So there is a real tension there. Um, and we don't have a set of proposals to deal with it, but I think it's something we're all going to have to work through over the next few years. Hi, I'm, I'm Lucy from Shepherd Neen. Um, it's about the uh, ratings. Um, I often play a game with myself, um, reading, reading a, a report to see whether I can guess. And bearing in mind, I look after 230 tenanted pubs, so I do read quite a lot of reports. And you cannot play the game of guess the score, get it right. You know, uh, this inconsistency is a real problem, actually. And one question that I have written to the FSA about and, and um, the Institute of Environmental Health is we have one local authority who, whenever they take someone down in a school. When, when you pay for the re-school, they say you can never get more than a four. They are the only local authority in, in the area that we cover that do this. And my question is, is that legal to do that? I've not come across that at all, I have to say. I mean, the answer, <laughs> what's the answer? <laughs> uh, We've got your question at the moment, and we're having a look at it, uh, if, you've, if you've written to us about it. So we're actively looking at the issue. So I'm not going to give you an answer, because I want the experts to have a look at it, um, and also because I don't have the answer. But we will come back to you on it. Sorry. I said I've come across that once with a client, um, so I'm not sure if it's the same authority. Um, but if, you know, reading the guidance, the rescore you can go up or down um, and therefore they should be looking at it with fresh eyes so I was quite surprised that a local authority was saying that you you can't get above a four um, because if you're looking at it with fresh eyes and you're there on the day and they've met full legal compliance which is what it's about it's not supposed to be about gold plating or anything 
then I don't see how they could not achieve a five. Yeah, if I just come back on that, you're absolutely right. It's within the brand guidance, there's no reason why you shouldn't get a five. What in effect I think they're doing is they're using the confidence in management sector and your previous low score in order to drag you down on the next occasion. And that is something that the FSA will need to consider. Richard? Yeah, I, I haven't come across uh, entire local authorities that have that approach as a policy, but I haven't come across individual officers that have that as a mindset, you know, that it's impossible to get a, get a five. What, what I will say for the Food Standards Agency is that the, the guidance, the brand standard, as, as you call it, is actually some of the clearest guidance you've ever published. <laughs> it's even, and, and the sections I, I navigate and gravitate to are the, this is what a five looks like, this is what a 10 looks like, and it's very good for industry. Uh, that's where my frustrations come in, because with guidance that is so clear, you know, why are we getting... Uh, you can't go above a, a four. You know that that's that it, it makes a mockery of of your excellent guidance. And I'm just going to come back to the point. And I'll whenever I've got a microphone in my hand, I always come back to this point that it's the appeals process that needs looking at because there are individuals that will, with the best of intentions, get it wrong, get it slightly uh, 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 out of kilter, and that's what the appeals process is for. It's the appeals process that really needs looking at. So you can. And I'll, and I'll say it in this vernacular term, so you can get the grown-ups in the room and you can have an honest look at how the score was put together. And then if, if the score is the score, fair enough, that, that's no, no argument. But if, if it is a four and you passionately think it's a five, then we need that independent review to actually make sure that the, that the correct score is getting, because I think it's more important to businesses than the, uh, the, the enforcement world actually realizes. Critical. Um, so we're about to wrap up. Any final questions from anybody before we finish? Yes, just one last one down there. Sorry. Uh, Sandra Moore from um, Hygienesis Environmental Health Consultancy. This is more a question for the FSA, really, about home caterers. So during lockdown, I was fortunate enough to do some work for um, a number of local authorities. Um, what I came across was a lot of home caterers were on the rise. I call it the rise of the home caterers. Are there any plans afoot to really look at what home caterers are doing and put any more um, guidance in place because they're doing weird and wonderful things in their homes? And I think it's going to be a potential bomb one day. I've come across home caterers pickling eggs. Um, you know, just, oh, I'll pickle some eggs and sell it to the local pub. The local pub's buying it. Come across someone doing um, kumbacha. Um, so all the sort of dehydrated foods, all the trendy foods that are going on at the moment. So just want to know if you've got any plans to do anything to m give some extra guidance. Because when you go to do an inspection, you have to give them notice that everything's hunky-dory. And you don't see a true picture. So... We've also seen a massive rise in, in small businesses and home catering during lockdown, unsurprisingly. Um, and it, it's, it's one of the areas that's been on our radar. For, and for our communications, um, we've been doing a lot of work on reaching people who are doing home catering and encouraging them to register. So we've had kind of um, social media campaigns um, making people aware that they do need to register as a food business. Uh, that's, I think that's been our primary focus, actually, in just getting, getting visibility for local authorities of, of home caterers because, uh, as you say, there's a, there's a massive variety of weird and wonderful things going on. And, and the first aim is to, to make sure that there is a food safety team having a conversation with that person because I think they're probably best pl placed to be giving them guidance on what they need to be doing. I don't think we've got any plans for sort of comprehensive home caterer guidance. Um, but... But we do. We are trying to kind of do much more intelligence gathering about what's going on across the sector, um, and identifying trends and issues. And if we if we see a trend emerging that we think has a real food safety concern for us, then obviously we'll think about putting out more guidance for for either local authorities or all the businesses on it. But um, at the moment, I don't think um, that we've got a, a sort of specific home caterer guide planned. But I think I do think the first priority is to make sure that those businesses are registered as food. Those people are registered as food businesses. And I take your point about having to give notice to enter a domestic premises. But but 
but even so then having the contact with them and the ability to for the um, EHO to be giving them some advice and talking to them about what they're doing, I think is very valuable. For, from our point of view, we've seen a, a significant increase in, in inquiries from home caterers wanting support. Richard? I heard the question correctly. I, I, my, my emphasis is more on public health at large uh, rather than home catering per se. I, I, I remember years and years ago you know my 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 grandmother used to make sandwiches for a local skittles club um that that brought the east northamptonshire eho to the to the house and they did an inspection and everything was fine you know that was that, i was a kid then i wasn't an eho so i couldn't advise her but the where i see the public health risk particularly with the rise of social media is where food processes are given out to people from a, a, a central entrepreneur or somebody that wants to make money in the, in the uh, I'm no problem with people wanting to make money, but what I do have a problem is people wanting to make money by putting food processes out into people's houses. Um, and you see these adverts on Facebook Marketplace and, and you just know that that's not an individual t trying to earn a few quid. This is part of a much bigger organisation. What and, and this isn't just me being the old duffer and the old dinosaur, but if you go back to the 1970 food hygiene regulations, there's a copy in circulation in this room. Um, look at Regulation 27. And if you can reenact that somehow in some guidance or somewhere, then I think that might be your answer. Regulation 27, it says food shall not be given out by any food operator to a domestic premises except for shrimp picking. And there's a reason for that. See me afterwards. Another, <laughs> another good thing from the 70s. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, so any other comments on that before we... Lovely, good. Um, thank you so much uh, for your questions. Uh, it was a really interesting debate. May I take the opportunity to thank our panel, Katie, Sterling, Daryl and Richard. Thank you for your questions. I hope you found that useful. Um, I certainly did. And I'll hand back to UK Hospitality who can finish things up. Thanks very much. <laughs>